This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hi, welcome to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. We have another amazing guest this week talking with the 52 top smallmouth bass anglers in the Ken- country. And Ken Galob is definitely one of them. This guy is extremely fascinating. Uh, having a discussion with him on this podcast really opened up my eyes when it comes to keeping track and writing down and logging Anything and everything that happens to you on a day of, of fishing on the water. And it's something that I plan on implementing in the future when it comes to my fishing. And this guy has a system in place, and he's going to talk a little bit about that, as well as how to approach the Finger Lakes and some of his techniques that he uses, because he does dominate that region of upstate New York. Uh, he's always up there. If he's not first, he's second. And uh, it's just, it amazes me the caliber of fishermen and anglers that we have on this podcast. I'm learning so much and we're only three weeks into it. If you haven't checked out our previous podcast, uh, season one, episode one with Scott Dobson, which was some amazing information. And then we, we talked to uh, Gussie in the, the previous podcast. I mean, these guys know how to catch smallmouth. And I hope you guys are enjoying the episodes. I do want to give a shout out to the Real Shot. They carry some of the best bass tackle that a smallmouth crush fan could want. Top brands like Mega Bass, Yozuri, Jackal, Evergreen, Z Man, Daiwa, Shimano, Dirty Jigs, Omega Custom Tackle, Kitex, St. Croix Rods, heck, even Guggen Baits. I mean, what more can you ask for? Real Shot's easy to shop website. We'll make selecting the exact product that you need super easy with same-day shipping. They'll help you get the product in your tackle box before your next tournament or bass fishing adventure. If you enter code SMALLMOUTHCRUSH15 at the time of the checkout, you're going to get 15% off your order. So pretty cool. Head on over to The Real Shot and let them know Smallmouth Crush sent you. And without further ado, let's bring on our next guest. And just like that, there he is. Ken, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm uh, still thawing out a little bit from uh, fishing this weekend in uh, 20 degrees and wind. But it's uh, crazy. Yeah, you're you're hardcore, yeah. man. You don't seem to stop uh, when it comes to uh, tournament fishing. Uh, your track record speaks for itself. That's why I wanted to have you on as a guest. But before we get into all that, let's get a little bit of background, Ken, on yourself. I know you're somewhere in upstate New York. And, uh, you know, following you around uh, throughout the year, you can be found fishing opens and different levels of tournaments all across the country. I know your son's a up and coming superstar in the fishing world. So I want to hit on that. But uh, go ahead and introduce yourself if you could. Yeah, No, I appreciate it. And, and I think this is a pleasure, you know, just the opportunity to talk to people and get about, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, information on the sport I love and, and my son loves now and you know, just kind of share some of that experience, but, you know, my, my experiences have been, have been vast. Um, you know, I've done, you know, the FLW tour, uh, on the pro level. Uh, and now I've kind of locally settled in here, uh, where I live and, and fishing the Finger Lakes regularly, more than regularly. Please don't tell anybody that, uh, uh, I'm not at work today. I'm, I'm talking fishing. We actually mapped out, we have, uh, 57 boat ramps, uh, within an hour and 15 minutes of our house. So, um, our, our primary goal is to take advantage of every single one of those. A lot of those are on the Finger Lakes. You know, the bigger ones, like everybody hears about, you know, Cayuga, Cayuga. Uh, but also, uh, I primarily like to uh, play around in my quiet time on on the little ones that no one hears about, like, um, you know, a little bit on Seneca. That's coming. That's going to be a tremendous fishery in the near future here. But Hemlock and Canadice, which... Uh, you know, those are the kind of gems, uh, nine, nine horsepower lakes. Uh, no one's on there, but canoers and kayakers and, uh, and me whipping around in a, in a nine, nine horse. It was, uh, bored out. It's probably actually about a 15 horse. So I, I think I can go about 40 in a nine, nine. So it's a bit of fun out there. 
Sure, sure. Now, do you get a chance to fish some of the bigger waters? Obviously, you know, living yeah. where you live in upstate, there's so many opportunities. I know you fish a lot of the Great Lakes. Uh, what would you say is your favorite place to to smallmouth fish in the country? If you could pick one. In the country, I, I'm, I'm 30, 32 minutes away from one and, and 27 minutes away from the other because I know that there's not a stoplight between uh, – uh, me and the lake, uh, but Hemlock and Canadice, those are uh, really the two uh, horsepower power restricted uh, lakes that literally, uh, if I go on there and see a boat, uh, it's a it's a major surprise. So those ones are, are kind of uh, in my back pocket, uh, gives me a lot of time to experiment. Those fish don't see pressure, so I can go in there with, with new baits and new ideas and new techniques and, and really have fish that, um, you know, kind of bite pretty willingly. Sure. You bring up a good point. So some of these lakes that are not as pressured, that's where you're going to experiment a little bit with different, different baits that you're, you're, you're looking at maybe using on some bodies of water that see, you know, the same thing all the time. Yeah. hundred percent. It, it just kind of gives you the confidence. The population in those lakes is a lot healthier and, and literally those fish will react uh, to things. So if, if I'm, you know, fishing a heavily pressured lake that we have a lot of tournaments like Canisius, that type of thing. And I've got an idea uh, in my head to try something. Generally, I'll run out to one of those two lakes first and, and just make sure, you know, it's something that's going to work. Um, you know, and it, it's kind of, you know, they're not goby system lakes, so you don't have the gobies. Those lakes react a little bit different. But, you know, as far as the seasonal patterns, um, it's real easy for me to follow those fish because they're in such big groups. You know, you're chasing groups of 100, 200 fish versus on Canisius. So those, those schools have broken down to maybe five or six or, or four fish in a group uh, now. So uh, once you find that group, you can go through and pattern things and, and try and learn some stuff on those less pressured groups. So for the viewers that are that are listening to this, uh, the Finger Lakes is a region and you're probably you can explain this a little bit better than than perhaps I can. But I'm going to try to try to get it right here. It's, it's just a region of lakes. That was obviously glacially formed way back, way way back when, and it's just a, a a unique set of lakes that expand probably a couple hundred miles wide as far as the region. And yeah, I, I would say I think I think I actually I did a uh, <laughs> not quite the YouTube star that you are, but um, I did do one video where I fished all eleven Finger Lakes uh, with the goal of catching one fish out of each lake, uh, and we managed to do that. Uh, we started right at sun up and. Uh, Right as the sun was going down, we caught our eleventh uh, fish on our eleventh lake. Um, so it's it's. So hold on, you went to every yeah. lake in the same day. Same day. Uh, oh, that's pretty cool. Same boat, uh, and managed to catch one fish in a couple of those lakes. I don't fish all the time, so uh, you know it was a little bit of a. Uh, and we did got some good drone video and that type of thing. It's it's not uh, as I said, it's not the caliber of what you pump out, but. It was a fun little video, and uh, on my YouTube channel, Ken Golub, uh, you can you can take a quick look at that. It, it was just a fun thing to do. We right. did it. Uh, we woke up uh, real early one morning, and my friend's like, "Where do you want to go fish?" I'm like, "Let's just grab the cameras and do this thing." So, uh, my friend Vince Lawyer, who I've been fishing with for years and years, uh, uh, grabbed the cameras, and we were. Uh, I threw the generator in the back of my truck. I almost caught my truck on fire because. Um, the uh, generator went up against the plastic part of the truck. The bed line started smoking. And so we, we probably would have finished a little bit earlier, but we had to stop and put the fire out in the back of the pickup truck as we're going down the road. It's an adventure, I guess. That's for sure. Absolutely. Well, it sound, that sounds pretty neat. I, I didn't know. I didn't realize, I guess, that there was 11 of them. Yeah. Uh, obviously. Yeah. What, where does it, uh, you know, just so our viewers know, where does it kind of, is, is Oneida included in that or is that not a finger lake? Oneida, Oneida is not. So really what you're going from is is probably a little bit uh, to the east of Buffalo. Uh, and then you stop um, just about Syracuse is is the last one. Um, you know, Skinny Atlas, Satisco, Owasco are on, on one side of it. You got the big ones in the middle with Cuca, Seneca, uh, and uh uh, Cayuga, which everybody obviously knows. And on the far side, you've got the two little ones, Honey Oil, which is a fabulous lake. I think I caught my, my fish on Honey Oil in about 16 seconds. We didn't get the boat off the trailer and I caught the, caught the first fish in there. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the far one is, is what I consider the, the tournament gem of New York and perhaps the tournament gem of the entire country in, in Canisius Lake. Cause it just spits out some big fish year after year after year, tournament after tournament after tournament. Wow, that's interesting. Now, 
as far as uh, the typical structure of, of the Finger Lakes, you know, I, I always describe them to people as kind of like a, a bowl with a grass edge that goes around somewhat structureless. I guess, is that a description that that's accurate with it? Is it, are they all pretty much the same when it comes to, you know, even water clarity? How would you describe the whole system or is every lake a little bit different? They're a little bit different, but they are, are all about the same. I mean, they, they generally all have grass, right? So the grass does come into play. Uh, with the exception of the two nine nine lakes I mentioned earlier, they all have docks. So, you know, docks can come into play. Obviously, not so much for smallmouth. Although one of our best patterns that we run on uh, on Kiuka, uh, believe it or not, is a uh, is a uh, dock pattern for smallmouth. So um, it does it does fall into um, you know that realm of, of a lot of different things. And you know, I, I like you have spent a lot of time with the electronics, and and I've graphed pretty much every single inch of those lakes. I probably have something like four. Uh, to 500 hours of, of idle time. Um, and there's some real interesting history that's sunk into some of those lakes. There's coal barges that uh, hold fish on Seneca. There's uh, um, two, uh, there's actually an old fire truck that I uh, found that uh, I catch fish off that uh, someone must have drove out on the ice after having a couple too many cocktails and old boats and that type of thing that, you know, that type of structure uh, in these type of lakes where there's not a lot of uh, uh, other structure uh, really comes into play as well too. Sounds like there's a lot going on on those lakes. Now, as far as smallmouth goes, there's smallmouth in every finger lake as Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I assume largemouth as well. It's got a really yeah. good mixed population. Is there lakes that you, when you do fish the finger lakes, you're going to target largemouth over smallmouth or vice versa, because you just know that there's bigger weight of a certain, you know, whether it be a smallmouth or a largemouth. If you go back really 11 years ago, I grew up on one side of the state and I live on the other side of the state now. So I've got a lot of time on, on the Finger Lakes uh, overall. But, you know, 10 years ago, um, maybe, you know, 15 years ago, people knew me as the worst smallmouth fisherman on the planet. Um, and I did well. I did really well fishing for largemouth. And I've kind of over the last 15 years really forced myself to to figure out the smallmouth. Um, to me, it's fun. I went to school for engineering. I used a lot of that organizational system of elimination type things that I was taught in school and, and you know, now with technology and that type of thing. And my kid, my kid feeds my energy into the sport. He comes up with new ideas and new places to go. Um, I've really kind of migrated to more of a smallmouth fisherman. There are times, though, um, clearly in the summer where um, some of these lakes, we just, and no one's figured it out. There's huge schools that just go out and suspend under bait, and uh, they're pretty much non-catchable. You might get lucky and get one, um, but there's times of the year that you just have to go for largemouth if you want to be competitive. The forage in the Finger Lakes. So, you know, a lot of these big smallmouth around the country, the Great Lakes, they're feeding on these gobies and whatnot, and that's what's really uh, pumping out the weights, uh, you know, a typical diet, I guess, on the Finger Lakes for a smallmouth, what is that going to consist of if there isn't gobies in those systems? Yeah, so where I'm starting to see gobies more and more, I do see them in Cayuga, I'm starting to see them in Seneca, but other than that, um, most of those bodies of waters are not connected, um, so they still haven't been introduced, and and they're still feeding on uh, uh, well, some of the ones like Canada uh, has smelt. That's perhaps the only one that has a decent population of smelt. But I think in the Finger Lakes, um, seasonally, uh, you're going to see, you know, different forage come into play. More crawfish. Uh, when you have the big die off of the baits uh, where they're suspending, you know, literally those fish will sit. You see them on the graph, right? Here's the bait. Here's the fish. You know, what happens is sooner or later that bait, the bulk of that bait dies when that water temperature starts getting down into the low seventies and into the sixties. And as that bait kind of just is gone or, or very limited that those fish start migrating, you know, to what they can attack on the shoreline, main, mainly crawfish and, and some other critters that are rolling around in there. So really the whole ecosystem kind of changes and it's very interesting because, you know, and, and as I, I perceive climate, climate kind of changing from year to year, um, you know, the water temperature clearly is, is changed 10 years ago. I have a notebook of every time I go to the lake, what the water temperature is, what I did, what I caught them on, where I caught them on. Um, you can see that right now, for instance, the water temperature on, on Canisius is typically what it used to be back in November. And we're sitting here in, in December, um, nearly the end of December. So, um, the patterns are happening later and later, uh, what those fish are doing are happening, you know, at different times. And, 
Um, it's all water temperature uh, dependent um, as far as chasing these guys on the finger lakes. Sure. So as far as uh, the smallmouth fishing on the finger lakes, is this something that you can take advantage of as soon as, because obviously you're covered by ice a lot of a lot of the winter months, but once that ice leaves, you know, day one, the boat launch is open. Can you catch a smallmouth all the way up till freeze up? Well, it's even better than that because Seneca does not freeze. And for uh, probably nine out of 10 years, uh, uh, Canandaigua does not freeze. Um, those I actually fish in, in January, February, uh, right through. And I can, uh, uh, what happens is those fish have, have very specific wintering holes. Uh, you know, those fish are, are very easy to catch at that point. Uh, you know, obviously I take a lot of care if I do fish in that time of year, it's, you know, immediate quick uh, catch and release. I'm not uh, one of these guys who'll put five of them in the live well and have a glory shot or that type of thing. But sure. there are spots uh, on some of those finger lakes right now where you can go put your boat on spot lock and for 50 consecutive casts, you can catch, you know, anywhere between a three and, and a five and a half pounder uh, in some of those wintering holes. Awesome. You know, we've just got to be careful to take care of them. So there's really a day um as soon as that water temperature hits let's say 60 degrees until it hits 60 on the other side i can catch you a smallmouth in any of the finger lakes pretty quickly um as i said during the summer when they get out under that bait uh, they become pretty darn difficult it's a it's a mystery that uh, i've been trying to figure out and a couple of my friends have been trying to figure out how to really get them yeah we'll go out there occasionally and catch one or two uh but we can't do enough to win a tournament in uh, you know, and you see that a little bit in um, when the elites came in, uh, you know, with with a couple of guys on Cuyuga that were catching summer, um, summer smallmouth. Zell, Zell Dane, I think, did a tremendous job. Um, but, you know, even so, he had a great bag, but he had five bites. Right. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like a seven bite or eight bite. He just got I don't say lucky because it's, it's difficult to do that. But um, that time of year, it whole it changes completely. It sounds like that's the uh, that pattern. If somebody could figure that out, is the the magic key, especially in the summer months. Yeah, you know, I don't have a whole lot of experience on the Finger Lakes myself, but having that smallmouth background, you know, I fished a few events this past summer, and one was on Cayuga. And in practice, my initial thought was, I got the best electronics in the world. I'm going to go out there and find these offshore smallmouth, and it didn't happen. And yeah. so uh, I was surprised that, you know, obviously after 20 or 20 or 40 minutes of idling around and not really marking things or, or, you know, going with maybe your, your live scope and, and spending a little bit of time and not seeing anything, you kind of lose interest quick and you head back to the, the grass edge and, and continue on. But I think that's a, that's a pattern that would be awesome to be able to unravel, but it seems like, those roaming fish, you know, so what if you do find them? They're not going to be there, you know, the next day or or in the future for you. You got to keep doing it every day and stay on that, it seems. Uh, a daunting task, you know, especially it's hard enough knowing good structure and where those fish are in the summer. They could be there one day, gone the next on on lakes that you you have that pattern dialed in. So throw that into the mix. You think they're just, they're obviously just following that bait and just roaming. Yeah, they're following the bait and roaming. And I, you know, they're, they're, we did, uh, you know, we fished a, uh, a night tournament. We don't have a lot of night tournaments in New York and, and we finally had one. And um, I had a theory on, on how to catch those big smallmouth. Um, and obviously my son and I ended up winning that tournament. Uh, I can catch those fish at night, right? I cannot catch them during the day. Hmm. So there is something, you know, that, that kind of probably puts them in a zone. And you just think about it. These lakes are thousands and thousands and thousands of acres and there's not that many of them there's not millions of them in there so it just becomes a game of and there's no current like you and i both fish you know thousand islands and the name of the game there is where's the current pushing the food and pushing the fish um in these finger lakes that bait just roams and roams and yeah you can find even even if i find a pod and i'm pretty good with a, with a 360 i can keep on a pod of bait kind of but you know, just to keep casting underneath it and through it and that type of thing. It just, it's, it's, it's just mathematically time-wise, uh, not something that's going to fall in your hands to win a tournament and, unless we figure something out uh, more than what we know right now. Sure. What do you think your, your biggest uh, strength when it comes to smallmouth fishing is as far as uh, techniques? Like what's a, what's a pattern you, you are like, 
all excited about if you know that's how you're going to be able to catch them? I mean, I'm kind of going to go around that question a little bit with really what I think makes me a little bit better. And, and, and you know, I, I've really got and I literally Excel sheet it. Right. I'm a, as I said, I'm an engineering nerd. Um, I Excel everything that works when it works, water temperature that works. And, and I've got it all drawn out. I've, I've the number is 38. I have 38 different baits hmm. that I catch smallmouth on. And when I'm going, you know, to a location, I'll look at some things. And unlike largemouth, where I don't think moon phase plays a lot into it, I think it does play a large part of it. You know, the feeding cycles throughout the day uh, for for smallmouth. They really do react to that. Where, and I think largemouth, you put it in front of them, they're going to eat it. But, you know, for instance, this, week, this weekend we're fishing on Harvey's Lake, and I knew it was just it was going to be dead between 11 and 1 o'clock. It was just a dead part of the, of the day. And sure enough, we didn't get bit during that part of the day. And as soon as that that cycle started coming back in, uh, you know, we kind of took advantage of, of that and they started eating again. But, you know, it, it really comes down to me organization. If it's cloudy, I know what bait to fish. If it's sunny, I know what bait to fish. If it's, you know, current, I know which bait to fish. You know, if it's colder temperature, I know, you know, to go with a blade bait. So I, I won't say it's one specific bait. There's baits I, I like fishing more than others. Mm hmm. But I don't ever try and get hung up in that because, you know, the couple times I've done that, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've fished with Jamie Hartman quite a bit. I've got a couple friends who are, are killer smallmouth, um, you know, anglers that uh, I've fished with. And I've just learned don't go in hard headed with with one bait and try and make it work. Find a series of baits, you know, and then kind of see what time and, and condition, um, you know, fits. Right. And perfect right. example is that was is what what. Uh, uh, I know Jamie was struggling up, you know, in the uh, elite series up on uh, on Champlain and he went to a Carolina rig. That's something that we we played with before and, and we'd got it to work. And he just kind of rotated through his baits. And, and, and all of a sudden the Carolina rig is 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 where other people were struggling. Um, so I, I don't really pigeonhole myself into into one bait. I really kind of look at, at the whole arsenal that, uh, that we've amassed over the years. Wow. So you uh, <laughs> there's a lot going on what you just said in the last uh five, eight minutes here, uh, responding to that question, you know, Excel spreadsheets, keeping track. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. extreme. Uh, I get it though. I mean, if, if someone was disciplined enough to, I wish I did, you know, I have, I have some videos that I can go back on and that's very helpful, but that's about it. Uh, I think one of the best advice you can give someone that's just starting is to do exactly what you said and what you do is that's record and keep track monitor everything you know even when you're talking about the moon phases can you give us uh, a couple examples of how you utilize that moon phase uh, yeah when so fishing? you know obviously there's you can go online and you can pull you know the active feeding you know cycles and if i have time to so for instance i've got a real job too right so i'm not fishing 100 percent of the time but you know i i can be flexible with my time as long as i get my job done I will look for times, you know, of the heavier feeding cycles and I'll, I'll build my day around that. So if I know I can only go out for four hours, right. And the better four hours are midday, I might knock off for four hours and go, you know, grab my kid and, and go fishing for four hours in the, in the peak part of the day, um, you know, and do my work on, on the other sides of that. But, um, you know, and if there, if it's a real high moon phase, I'll go to faster moving baits. Right. So, you know, I was, again, I, I a lot of lucky things that fell, fall into my pocket as far as learning things. Um, I was actually on, on, um, uh, Gunnersville when that whole a rig came out. Right. So I was, I found a spot, uh, it was an FLW tour event. I thought I was going to do really well because I found a great, and I had a crankbait bite and it kind of went away. I still ended up doing okay, but literally two of the guys that started throwing the A-Rig at that event were on my spot right around me, clobbering them with that thing. And I didn't have an A-Rig. I didn't know what the heck they were throwing under the tournament. I found out and they're like, well, you, if you want one of those things, go, go to the bait store, around the bait store, go up the dark steps in the back, bang three times on this, on the secret door and tell this guy that you want to buy one of these things. So this was that tournament when they first came on the scene. Yeah. What you yeah. think there's a yeah. dude whipping something next to you. I mean, were you trying to like, like, what, the shock? Heck you like what the heck is that? That dang thing. Well, anyway, as it turns out, I, I, I got one, I came back and I had an absolute blast. I probably had that about two years in New York before, uh, before anybody else did. And my gosh, it was like, like crack. I don't think I worked. I think I took a month off and, and just threw that thing. Um, and it was phenomenal right now. The fish have seen it. They're getting used to it just like anything else. But, 
Um, you know, that's one of the baits, if you will, in the arsenal, you know, and that, well, one of the, one of the two, right. I, I really have a, a bladed version and an unbladed version. And, you know, I, I can tell you, like some of my notes tell me like on, on a, on a cloudy day, um, I want those blades on a real bright, sunny day. I don't want those blades. Right. So I've taken that time, you know, I've measured the success with the blades, without the blades, and, and that was, was that a general example, or is that a fact? That's fact. That's yeah. one of the things that, that I've figured out or tried to figure out. So, again, I think a lot of things come with confidence, right? It doesn't mean that you know if it's not working, I won't switch back to the other one on a sunny day. But that's the type of thing that that I really you know kind of measure and, and a starting and, point based on your history. Yeah, and there and there's and there's you know other things too, like well, you know. Some days they like day rig a lot better. You know, typically I'll, I'll give a little bit, right? That's, the, you know, the, the colder the temperature gets, a lot of times, you know, that comes into play on a lake like Oneida, where if the water temperature is on a warming trend and, and, and heading up, I like a single swim bay, right, as, as opposed to in a mass. And that's just kind of things that I've measured out. You know, before I go to the lake, you know, I didn't used to do this. I wasn't like this. But before I, I go to the lake, I sit here in my basement that you're looking at right now. There's a pile of rods back there. I just go through and I pre-rig things and I, I pretty much print out my spreadsheet. So, you know, when I flip my rod lock, they're open, you know, all that information's there kind of with a checklist of, of things to do. So I never fall into that pattern of a panic or this sucks or whatever. I've always got the next step. If this pattern doesn't work, this is the next step in what I'm going to do. And it's based on what my history has shown me in the past. Hmm. You must share that list with your son, right? <laughs> my son is adding to that list faster than uh, than I could. He's he's literally amazing. And I mean, you know, the stuff he showed me. I wasn't a big believer in watching a lot of YouTube, and 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 uh, he goes to Tackle Warehouse. What's the hot new bait, right? He actually goes to that and makes me buy it if it comes up on the hot new bait list. He, he's buying one, right? So I can't argue with him because. Once again, we went to Canisius Lake, and if you haven't seen what that kid has done on that lake as far as lunker, it seems like every Tuesday night tournament, there's like 20, 30 boats. That kid has lunker every single, you know, I'm like, I can't argue with you. But, you know, he's just kind of gone through and taken the the uh, the trial and same type of thing. You'll have, you know, not just one or two or three. He'll have seven rods ready. You know, uh, three of them are the meat and potatoes, right, that we always do good on, and then he's always – always throwing an experiment rod or two in there to try something new. So it sounds like, you know, your strength comes just from fishing history and having all that knowledge recorded. Um, and you did go around that question. So I'm going to ask you another way. If you could, what's a, what's a technique or bait that you just love to throw? That's one of your favorite ways to catch smallmouth. Hmm. I would probably go with top water on that. Um, and that's more of a recent thing too. That wasn't in my, in my box of tricks, if you will. Um, you know, but now this early morning, um, and, and I, one of my, one of the guys I fish with, um, you know, I had my kind of thing set. He took me to school in the last, in the first, you know, first 20 minutes of that tournament morning, he, he just absolutely loaded them, uh, with a little, uh, uh, spook, little Zara spook, um, in bone color. He just absolutely put a lick into him. Mm. Uh, and that probably has become one of my favorite, uh, you know, one of my favorite baits right at this point. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit about that because topwater is, you know, everyone that fishes loves that bite, loves that uh, reaction bite when it comes to fishing topwater. And there's so many topwater baits out there. And I've always wondered because I love throwing, I, I like to keep things basic when, when I fish. So I'll have a pop bar and then some type of walking bait. To be honest with you, that, that super spook junior yeah. To me, it seems like it's just, it's amazing, you know, standard colors, whether it be, you know, maybe a, a, a white, a black, and maybe a clear. I don't get too fancy with all the different colors, but if you look at, at the tackle industry, and I just, I want to ask you this question because it sounds like you like throwing, you started throwing it quite a bit. You know, there's so many different topwater baits and walking baits. I mean, you could spend 30 bucks on a Japanese walking bait out there. Do you have to? Do you think that super spook can get the job done? Or is there I, a... I do. You do? Yeah. I, I do. I mean, do I experiment or does my kid experiment? experiment? Yeah, but you know what? At this point, um, that is the bait I'm comfortable with. If, I, if I'm throwing top water, you, you just name the exact bait, and I'm throwing it in a, in a bone color. Um, I, I haven't gone to the black. I've tried to clear. It doesn't really seem to, to improve my bites, but if they're on that top water bite mm -hmm. and 
a top water bite does exist. Trust me in the right conditions. Um, that's pretty much the betting I throw. I mean, I, I, I don't have the patience, you know, again, some things that go into what are you good at? I, I don't have the ability to throw a pop bar. I'm just not that patient. Um, I probably fish it wrong. I haven't had a lot of success on it. I've seen guys, and I know guys catch them on it, um, but I, it, I, I just can't make it work. And, and, and that's one of the things I think we've got to learn. There, there's things my kid can do with baits or things I can do that he can't replicate. Right? And sometimes you can figure it out, right? So, you know, for instance, um, I fish with a guy, Evan Perry, right? Everybody knows the guy. He likes Everybody, everybody knows Evan likes throwing a, a Ned rig. And he was kicking my teeth. I wasn't throwing the same bait. He was kicking my teeth in, right? I mean, he literally two, three tournaments in a row, I'd have my bite, you know, early morning bite, this bite would work. And then the Ned rig would come on for a period during the day. He'd kick my teeth in. And I'm throwing the same exact bait. And then I finally said, let me pick up your, your rod. Let me throw this. I, you know, I call it, I, I call it the trailer park bait because I hate the thing, but I love it because it works. I'm like, let me throw that thing first cast out there. You know, that rod just made that bait a little bit different, um, uh, the way it acted. And, um, I bought myself a rod and now I can keep up with them. Um, you know, some days I can beat them on that bait, but it, it's, it's the rod. You know, I think that there's, there's definitely, uh, some differences that, you know, the rod and the tackle on the line and that type of thing all kind of can filter in and, and, and really make a big difference. So I, I agree 100% with you. There's so many instances, and especially when you fish with somebody else in the boat and, you know, why is that person getting more bites? You're using the exact yeah. same bait and it does come down to sometimes, you know, your line and your rod and the action of that rod and how you work it, all the cadence and everything. It's, it's always a mystery. You know, there's so much that goes into it. You know, obviously you have things really dialed in. And my next question, an area of improvement when it comes to uh, different techniques. And it sounds like maybe for you, I don't want to speak for you, but maybe that that pop our bait is a weakness of yours. Do you have any any other techniques that you just don't use and you, you would like to or that maybe you've tried in the past and you just said, you know what, this isn't for me? I, I think I started when I started becoming really successful. Uh, locally with smallmouth that was on the drop shot and I did okay on it. And then to be honest, I just got away from it. Right. I, it just, you know, fell down my list of, of, of my 38 things and I've still got stuff I know works, but new baits come out. Right. I mean, there's, you know, a, a new different thing and, and those do make a difference. Right. I mean, there's, I don't have to go into some of the drop shot baits that, that have, have kind of drastically increased the catch rate lately. Um, I, I think I probably need to get back onto the drop shotting aspect, um, a little bit more than, um, you know, I, I, it's definitely an area I can kind of sharpen up on. Cause I, I do enjoy sitting on top of them with my electronics. I know how to do it. Um, it just kind of gotten away from that technique and I, I probably need to go back to it a little bit more. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that makes sense. You know, there's with, when it comes to drop shotting, there's so many different ways to fish a drop shot too, whether it be casting up shallow or working them deep, uh, those finger lakes, I would think that would have been like right there. Uh, I'm surprised that, that it's not, can you give us your top, you know, I know it's hard. You got 38 different baits that you go around it, but what would be, uh, a typical setup for you when you're targeting those smallmouth on the finger lakes? If someone's just going up there for the first time and they want to, uh, throw a few different baits and techniques around what what would you suggest starting off with um i think that ned rig is a great beginner bait because you know again to get the nuances and and get really good at it um uh, that takes a little bit of time but i think you know when i when i do guide on the finger lakes that's typically a bait i'll have somebody uh or younger kids or somebody that's not a, a, a well-versed fisherman I'll, I'll have them do that um you know, I kind of played around with a lot of things. I think one of the things I've, I've bumped into lately is uh, um, the um, Limit Maker. I think that's uh, made by Big Bite. I don't know if you've ever seen that thing. I have not. No, explain that. Um, it's like a Ned Rig, but it has a little tail, and that little tail acts like a little rattlesnake going back and forth. So that bait, I think, is is one that has really bumped up in my arsenal of 38 and, and gone way up the list because it, I think it adds the additional motion. It doesn't float as well as the standard Ned rig, so you've got to be a little bit more careful that 
that whatever head you're using actually helps stand the thing up so it so it wiggles a little bit where a ned rig will kind of stand up on his own no matter what head you put it on mm -hmm. that limit maker i think is is really a quality bait uh, especially for pressured fish the other thing um i've really gotten into is is stanley's um uh, drop shot goby um, and you can fish that on a football head you can fish it on you know a regular standard drop shot that type of thing but uh, it's a very 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 realistic um, uh, goby shaped bait um, and the colors i think are, are just dead dead on hmm. absolutely dead on um, ganjo makes some great drop shot um, uh, baits as well too uh, but I think if I had, if I had to throw one or two, and, and again, make sure that there's gobies in that lake before you try and replicate that. Well, that's some really good stuff when it comes to fish in the Finger Lakes for sure. And a lot of inland bodies of water across the country, you can definitely take these uh, tips and techniques that that Ken was talking about, logging, you know, recording what goes on out on the water, the conditions, the different baits that you use. This is all good stuff. We're going to take a quick break here and come right back. <laughs> listening to the small mouth crush podcast don't rush out to the water just yet we'll be right back after this break have you ever wondered if your electronics are set up perfectly or perhaps there's a a specific technique that you just want to learn a little bit more about maybe you have a tournament coming up on a new body of water and you want a second pair of eyes on how to approach that maybe it's your home body of water and you want to go through some seasonal patterns i'm offering a service called the smallmouth crush one-on-one -on -one. it's actually a web-based program so we can meet virtually and i can answer any fishing related question that you may have any topics any questions we're going to go into detail and then we're going to be able to record that conversation so you can have a copy of that and look look over that in the future. It's a really neat program I'm excited to offer. And if you want to take advantage of this, all you have to do is head on over to my website, travismanson.com. Upper right-hand corner, you're going to find the link, Smallmouth Crush one-on-one. -on -one. And it goes into detail as far as what that service has to offer. And I look forward to chatting with you. We're back to the Smallmouth Crush podcast with your host, Travis Manson. All right. Welcome back. So Ken, one question I really want to ask is, you know, as far as, uh, and I ask everybody on, on the podcast, I want to know what your personal best smallmouth is. And did it come from a finger lake? It did not come from a finger lake and it was the worst fish I ever caught in my life. Let me okay. tell you. Um, and this is typical of smallmouth. So um, actually was, was this year um, I was pre-fishing. It was the last day. Um, I had a, very good practice for the uh, New York Bass Federation that was out of Clayton on the Thousand Islands. And, um, you know, pretty good, solid pattern and, and um, something in the back of my brain. And, and uh, uh, my kid were also saying, let's go up, you know, well past Messina. You've got a spot there that, you know, I, I done incredibly well uh, on in, uh, in a tournament in the past. It was a tournament you fished. As a matter of fact, it's a it's a tournament where I had a, a very big bag of fish, uh, and uh, on the way back, uh, I got stuck in a tremendous storm and uh, ended up uh, tolling my boat. That's uh, it was, oh, yes. it was right how can we forget that day? Yeah, yeah. Which uh, again, safety always first when you're when you're fishing for smallmouth. We we were, uh, you know, fortunately not injured or anything like that, but always keep an eye on the weather. Uh, the waves were probably ten foot plus and. Uh, uh, hide to lock the motor and that type of thing. But that spot uh, there was, is just a tremendous spot. So we ran down there uh, with only about an hour or two for the tournament meeting. And um, I went down there, took one pass and I caught my largest smallmouth I've ever caught, which was seven uh, pounds on the head sure. uh, on a, a, the right, right scale and everything. I measured it, which was, was about six inches bigger than anything else I've ever caught. And um, it was great. So we jumped back on the trailer. Uh, I, I uh, aborted my whole uh, pre-fish plan and, and all my uh, guaranteed solid fish uh, that I knew I could catch uh, for the Bass Federation. I ran way up to that spot and uh, took about four passes on it and didn't get a bite and started running a panic pattern on the way back and uh, ended up doing pretty bad because, you know, I let one fish. Uh, a smallmouth kind of determined my tournament day, which I, I never recommend doing. <laughs> sure. Wow. What'd you catch them on? Uh, that one was caught on uh, a drop shot. I told you I don't use drop shot a lot, but that was on a uh, a drop shot, uh, Stanley Gobi. 
Okay, sure. Man. Yeah, that's a good fish anywhere in the country. Yes, yeah, so the St. Lawrence River does put out some big fish. When it comes to the Finger Lakes, what would be a good, I guess, uh, average weight when you're targeting smallmouth? I mean, is there is there plenty of fours and fives in there? Or, are yeah. You, yeah. Typically, um, tournament-wise, you know, in the fall, um, I like to have 22, 23, and I feel pretty good that we'll have a shot at winning. Um you know, the biggest I've had out of a out of the Finger Lakes is is just shy of twenty six, mm. uh, or for smallmouth. Now, if I go to Canadice or Hemlock, I can do a lot better than that. Uh, but again, there's no tournaments on those lakes, and and uh, but uh, a, a six and a half is is huge uh, for a Finger Lake fish sure. for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty typical. If anything over that, I mean, a five pound smallmouth anywhere in the country is a big fish, no doubt. What is your favorite time of year on the Finger Lakes to target fish? Who it depends, you know, really, I, I like going out there on my own, right. Or, or with my kid in complete solitude and in a snowstorm when it's, when it's 20 degrees and you're chipping ice out of your guides and, and, and there's nothing around, but you know, maybe a, I've seen a bear on the shoreline or some uh -huh. deer squirrels rattling around in there, but I kind of like that solitude time where, you know, I'm out there on my own and, uh, you know, kind of experiencing, you know, nature with no houses and no jet skis mm -hmm. and no other anglers around. Um, and, and you can catch a lot of fish at that time of year. So I, I would have to say it's, it's one of those snowy January days, um, where I have to put the plow on the truck and, and plow the ramp out, uh, to get in and out. Sure. Late season. I I'm assuming your, your presentations, mostly a blade bait at that time, or is there a few other tricks you want to want to share as far as catching them in those yeah. colder temps? Yeah, blade bait um, definitely plays into it um, or just a really, really, really slow drag. Um, believe it or not, the old fashioned tube um, comes into play, but it's not, you know, that standard drag. It's just kind of a, a very slow drag and a, and a pop. Uh, the fish are very, very much glued to the bottom. Um, I've learned a lot about reading a graph from that time of year. Um, Sometimes we go through an area and there, it doesn't look like there's any fish. Um, that's what it looks like a lot of times in, in the winter. Those fish are, are belly down um, onto that bottom. And for the most part, unless you're really staring at that graph really, really tightly, you can you know kind of see a little color variance in the bottom or, or whatever. It almost looks like a stick or a, you know, a small rock or something on the bottom. Sure. Um, you know, those fish are, are pretty lethargic that time of year. So it's, it's got to be something really slow. Um, hair jig, don't overlook a hair jig either. Right, right. Are those uh, those depths that you're targeting that time of year, are you 20 plus feet or are you up shallow yeah. or sometimes? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, up to 50 to 60 feet at times. Oh, wow. So. Okay. Yeah. Real deep. Yeah. Real deep. Interesting. All right. Another question we got to ask everybody. And this might be hard for you and your 38 baits that you just love. But if I had to say, Ken, next year, you can only use one bait for the whole season. And that's it. What's it going to be? Ooh. I'm going to force myself to get better and go to that uh, one I said is most underutilized because I know there's a lot of potential. I would I would jump into uh, a drop shot because, again, you can fish it shallow. You can fish it medium. Okay. You Deep. You can fish it in current. You can fish it in still water. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most versatile bait. Um, and I would have to say um, that's where I would go. So drop shots, a technique. What is the plastic that's going to be on that drop shot hook? You only get oh one. My. Um, well, we're working on one. My son came up with a color. I'm sure a lot of guys know uh, William Clute with, with Ganjo. Uh, my son actually came up with a, uh, a color uh, and he got, uh, I call him Dr. Clute uh, to pour, but uh, it's kind of, uh, without giving too much away, it's kind of a peanut butter and jelly type colored uh, goby. Uh, that would be the bait because they seem okay. to eat everywhere, uh, everywhere they go. Perfect. Perfect. Now, what do you think separates, you know, top anglers like yourself across the country when it comes to smallmouth bass fishing? What makes you so successful? I know we hit a little bit about that earlier on, but uh, in closing, you know, what what are some advice you can give someone that's trying to become a better a better angler? 
I'd, I'd say really two things. Number one, the obvious one, right? Time on the water. Nothing at all is ever going to replace that. Um, the other thing is, is be real selective on who you're friends with. Um, you don't want to get the doc talk. Um, I've got, you know, a lot of high quality anglers, anglers I'm friends with that we share our little book of secrets or parts of our secrets or, or that type of thing. I think you kind of need to talk, tuck into there um, to put yourself on an acceleration curve um, and not tuck into, you know, someone who's going to give you bad info. So, and that's give and take, you need to understand that that's, that's really, when I go fishing with, you know, Jamie, or when I go fishing with, with Casey Smith, um, they may show me something. Um, and I know the worst thing I could ever do is, is let that out in public or maybe do a, uh, a, a video on it, sure. and put it on YouTube or, you know, that type of thing. So I think they're recognizing those lines. Um, that's probably the best way to get yourself accelerated. There's so much to learn. I mean, whether it comes to electronics or, or baits or techniques or locations, uh, that's why this game is so fun to me. Uh, because of all those variables and putting those variables together to have the perfect day. Um, but I, I would really say that, uh, you know, putting yourself in the right boat with the right person and showing the right amount of respect is the way to go. Sure. No, that's great advice. Now, I, 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 I said that was the last question, but I got one more because this is awesome. I could literally sit here and talk to you for hours about smallmouth fishing and the Finger Lakes. I mean, you're a true expert, a true uh, hammer when it comes to to the Finger Lakes up there. A guy like myself who doesn't have a lot of experience on the Finger Lakes, and let's say I want to go enter a tournament and compete against someone like you that pretty much wins everything up there. Is there hope for us? What do we got? <laughs> Where's the starting point? Like, how do we compete against somebody like you on those bodies of water? Is, is it possible or is it just because you have so much history? You know, your top five guys are always going to be up there and you just put time in on the water. Or do we have a shot to show up and, and kick your butt one of these days? Well, you got to leave my kid on the bank because half the time that I do bad, he's the one that saves me. So if he stays on the bank, um, you can do good. I, I just think that, you know, you have to, for, you have to, I, I change what I do five, six times a day, right? And every single one of those decisions needs to be correct. Five different bait changes, five different location changes intermixed. Um, yeah. You with smallmouth here with the amount of pressure, the days of going to one point and throwing one bait, are pretty much gone. Mm. The days where maybe you can go to one good point in the lake and rotate, you know, throughout the day with different baits, um, you can give me and, and some of those top fives a good headache, but I don't think you can throw the same thing in the same location. You know, yeah. all day. I don't think you can go around the lake with one bait in your hand. Interesting. With that all day. It just, it, I, th I think where we pick up that type 5%, if you will, picks up is the fact that we know that in the morning they want this in the afternoon they kind of want this and when the wind blows from the west need to go to this bank um that i think is what what separates some of the top guys from uh, and i i force myself what do i do, what do i do to keep myself sharp i i go to lakes i've never i went to wall and paul pack last weekend and never been there i threw 100 bucks on the table to enter a tournament and ended up second there but you know uh never fished there. You know, I forced myself to look at the, you know, look at, uh, you know, the Lawrence app on my phone, find out where we're going to start and keep my knife sharp and make sure my brain is, is functioning. I'm not falling into bad habits and, and, uh, try new things. So, um, I, th I think that's kind of the key. Awesome. No, that's great. Uh, anyone who's interested in fishing the Finger Lakes, this is definitely the podcast they need to listen to. This was some really good information. Uh, Ken, how can they follow you on social media? And uh, do you have any sponsors you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, um, I'm a big Facebook guy, right? I'm that's that's kind of my ticket. Not, not so much the Twitter and the other stuff, although I do have those accounts. But you know, Ken Golub uh, on Facebook, uh, I do put a lot of stuff up there. You know, my kid, uh, you know, puts a lot of stuff up there on his. Um, he, he's just a phenomenal stick for a for a 16 year old. There's not, uh, I don't know of a 16 year old that's won as many tournaments as he's won. Uh, but we try and put a lot of stuff up there and we'll be doing more as, as he enters the college fishing circuit as well, too. Um, but uh, Bass Cat is, is my number one circuit. I, I can't tell. I know people say I love my boat. Well, I love my boat. Um, I love what the company does for me. I love, you know, um, uh, being able to pass everybody. I passed you quite a few times. I do remember. So, um, 
Basket uh, primary sponsor and absolutely love Rick Pierce and, and what that company spits out there for a product. Um, Stanley Bates has been tremendous. I've had the ability to work on a couple prototype lures with them uh, that will be coming out again that fall into both large mouth and small mouth realm. Uh, will include up at uh, Gajo, you know, great guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, also runs a nice guide service out of there if you're looking for someone to take you uh, small mouth fishing in some incredible places. Uh, he would be the guy. I know you've you've fished with him as well too up there, um, but uh, you know that's kind of the ticket. And you know, as I said, it's it's all about learning and and enjoying the sport. And I definitely appreciate the ability to speak with everybody today. All right, perfect. I appreciate it, Ken. And as okay. always, until next time, we'll see you guys on the water. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Smallmouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Smallmouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.